Behold your king, who has preserved you in your life to this very day, and who has blessed and prospered and nourished this congregation for 145 years. Behold your king. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, you're here. You made it. Today's a milestone, not just because it's a 145-year anniversary celebration for our beloved congregation, but it's a milestone because today marks the very last day of the church year. For the last 12 months, week in and week out, you and I have been reading and we have been meditating upon and we have been hearing the life and the ministry and the actions of Jesus Christ. Today is Christ the King Sunday. So what are we going to focus on to celebrate? I mean, there's a lot of stories about Jesus that we could choose from to be the focus of our worship on this great day. Stories based upon his words and his works that when you put it all together clearly show the power and the glory that is his that is worthy of calling him a king. But if you think the story of the crucifixion is the perfect story to be focusing on for this Christ the King Sunday, then you are in the minority. See, the truth is that those first observers at the cross, they thought that this crucifixion was far from being a crowning moment. And there are still people today who think, who will share with you, that they think that any God who would send his son to die on a cross is a cruel God. And that kind of God they don't want anything to do with. Even for us here sitting this morning, I mean, look at the cross. Does he look like a king to you? He's humble. He's passive. He's dying. He's dying. He gives himself to death, even death on a cross. So why in all the world are we rewinding back to Golgotha on this day? Why are we rewinding and circling back to the hill of the skull on this Christ the King Sunday for the focus, as the focus for our, for our attention and meditation this day? Because there, Jesus did something that absolutely no one else could ever do. He won the greatest victory in the history of the universe, and he shows the power and the glory of his kingdom at that very same place. And this morning, Luke, the apostle, is going to help us see and celebrate his crowns at the cross, the crown that he wears as the Christ, but also the crown that he won as the crucified. For you. So this morning, Luke acts at this section of his gospel. He acts as kind of a cameraman, um, pointing out different perspectives of the crucifixion for us. And his camera starts far back, and all we see is the people stood watching. Well, what do you think they were thinking? Where are his hands now? The hands that healed. <sighs> Where is his power now? Where is the power that drove out demons? The power that raised people back to life? They were probably thinking, looking at this, oh, come on. Is it really going to end like this? Where is my Palm Sunday King that I had just a week ago? They were looking at this. There was not a king in this Jesus that any one of them could see. In fact, they looked at this. They didn't know what to believe anymore about him. 
Well, the camera zooms in just a little bit closer so we can hear the sneers and the jeers of the religious leaders. And they say, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. This Jesus is just a phony. He's a faker. I told you all the time, Nicodemus. He's no good. He's just a charlatan like all the others. The chosen one is supposed to be bringing justice to the nations, and we're still under Roman opposition. He's a faker. He's a fraud. You see, for the religious leaders, Christ and the cross did not mix. Well, the camera, Luke's camera, zooms in a little bit further. And even the soldiers, the representatives of Rome itself, they even had their two cents to kick in, chime in on this whole situation. If you are the king of the Jews, prove it by saving yourself. If you have any power, you sure aren't showing it because we just dragged you here flogged and beaten. And you gave us absolutely no resistance whatsoever when we drove those nails through your hands and through your feet. Well, you might be the king of the Jews. Prove it. If you are the king of the Jews, ha ha, save yourself. Luke's camera now pans in pretty close up, a nice close up now to that sign above Jesus' head that's nailed to the cross. It says, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. You know what Pilate was doing there, don't you? He was mocking Jesus. But more importantly, he was mocking the Jewish nation. He was reminding them, Jews and you religious leaders who think that you have as much power over the people as I do, don't ever forget, I still have my Roman thumb on you. And this pathetic excuse for a man, this little puny Jesus, this is your king? <laughs> it's embarrassing. You people are as pathetic as your king, he was saying with the sign over Jesus' head. And then Luke pans in almost one last time to the lowest of the low, even the other criminal on the other side of him had a commentary on this whole situation. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. What's the point in all of this? What's being revealed by Luke's camera to us here this morning? From Romans to Jews, from the upper class to the lower class, from the militarily trained to the theologically trained, no one, no one saw a crown on Jesus' head that day. This is not just an ancient problem. This is a timeless problem. Those people, they evaluated based upon their own understanding of what the Christ was supposed to be. And they came to this conclusion. He's not it. So what about us? Take all of the power and the glory, the actions and the gifts, the authority and the guidance that you've learned this past year. Take all of that and then combine with it all that you have learned and heard about Jesus. Put it all together and ask yourself the question, am I content? Am I content in the grace of Christ? That's the big question that we need to ask ourselves. You see, we grumble and we complain when things aren't going right for ourselves and when it doesn't go the way that we want to, as if he has no crown on his head at this point in, in time, in this point in history. And there's the problem that we all have in our evaluation of the Christ. This is the kingdom of God. When's the kingdom of God coming? And we begin to sound 
like all of those people gathered around the foot of Jesus' cross. Hmm. Come back to the cross. You've been welcomed home to come back to the cross and see how real crown winning is achieved. This scene before you is not a failure. This scene before you is not an accident. This is God's greatest expression of love for you. This is why he came. Behold the Son of God, the Christ, hanging on a tree to make himself your tree of life. Behold your king. Well, Paul pans his camera over to one last commentator on the cross. It's the other criminal. God's holy law had convinced this other criminal that uh, his punishment fit the crime, and that's why he rebuked the other criminal, the first criminal, when he said to him, Don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. Then the clarity of the fear of God kind of crushed in on him when he realized his relationship with the Lord above. And he said, but this man has done nothing wrong. And even at the cross, this criminal saw with the eyes of faith that crown on Jesus' head that he was wearing. And so he realized that God was not just waiting for him on his throne of judgment when he finally breathed his last. No, God was there, just a whisper away. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me with your ready-made grace on your lips, your ready-made grace in your hands. Remember me when you come into your kingdom and extend that grace of forgiveness to me when your kingdom is, when we're finally brought to your kingdom. You see, that, uh, that second criminal, he had lost in his war against sin, and that's why he was where he was at. But with eyes of faith, he looked to the one who had done nothing wrong. He looked to the God, he looked to the Jesus who covered, who would cover all of this sin in his life with his victory, who would cover it with his crown that he won as the crucified. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. My friends, I could take a bullet for you. It might extend your life, but it would do absolutely nothing for your soul. I could cash in my RRSP and go out and buy 100,000 bulls and goats and sacrifice every last one of them for you in your name. And it would do absolutely nothing to pay even one cent for the price of your indebtedness and your sin to God. As we sing in stanza four a hymn 401, 10,000 deaths like mine would have been all too few to pay your debt to God, to pay my own debt to God. You could, have, you could spend a billion years in hell and you would not begin to fulfill your sentence of debt that you owe to God because of sin that had made you hostile to him. That's why we welcome you home. Come back to the cross. Come back to the cross because our king is the only one who can do what he has done. Pay the price for your sins. Give you the promise of the forgiveness of your sins and give you your own crown of life that he won himself for you at the cross and at his resurrection.
So, I guess, focusing on a story of the crucifixion on Christ the King Sunday isn't such a bad thing after all, because Christ is the King at the cross. And today, we celebrate his two crowns. We celebrate those crowns today, and God willing, always. Brothers and sisters in Christ, behold your King. Behold your Savior. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, it will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.